there's something about a railway that never fails to fascinate. All aboard! and welcome to the show and today we are reviewing I, I believe this is a world exclusive uh, this is the 1937 from Dan Henry um, so I'm very very privileged to bring you this review so I have four examples before you uh, well three here and then the fourth one is my wristwatch check as you can see there As always, let's start with a little bit of backstory. So Dan Henry is a world famous watch collector from Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, he has been a lifelong connoisseur and collector of watches. And legend has it that he owns over 1500 watches in his personal collection alone. Uh, after 30 years of collecting, he turned that knowledge and gigantic collection into one of the greatest online resources a watch collector could ever ask for uh, with time.watch. This is a highly intuitive and easy to use rich database of images and information that tracks in chronological order many of the greatest watches uh, and helps the user to get a, a good overview of the evolution of wristwatches like no other interactive medium available and i highly urge you to check it out um it's completely free and you can access it online just a wonderful wonderful i, I i've spoken about it before i, I use it uh, constantly when i'm researching uh, my videos now he went a step further and turned that passion into one of the greatest micro brands beloved by enthusiasts the world over in September 2016, Dan released his first four lines of watches. Each one of them paid homage to a particular era. So we had the 1930s, 40s, 60s, 70s, and so on. And around this time, I was just getting into my YouTube. In fact, I remember posting the video and it featured the 1939, which I was absolutely um, smitten with. And uh, I was really impressed at the finesse of the design and the refreshing combination of historical references that made his watches not merely a simple homage, uh, but often very, very well-considered amalgamations of several different key watches of each time period, uh, and the watch designated with the year as the name. So finally, there was a brand that was making available watches that are often too rare, fragile, or expensive to own, but with a more durable construction and always at a very affordable competitive price. After personally owning the 1964, I uh, swapped it for the 1962 that came out later, which I still own uh, and it's part of my own collection. I absolutely adore it. In fact, here it is right here. Uh, and I've put it on a suede strap. Still absolutely adore this watch. But as you see, it's a combination of uh, Universal Genève, a little bit of Speedmaster, so on and so forth. Now I have reviewed that, so have a look back. Now I met Dan at a watch event uh, while he was visiting his family in NYC and I had the pleasure of getting to know him. Uh, his love of watches, art, culture and life in general is deeply inspiring and it really translates to his watches and I just have to say that he is one of the most down to earth and um, after talking to him he wanted to give me this exclusive on the 1937. So as always, let's start with dimensions and they are all exactly the same size, I have to note. So first of all, we have a diameter of 38 millimeters there and the bezel case is flush. The height, we're looking at a lovely cuff friendly 12 millimeters, lug to lug 45 and a half, I would say, a lug width of 20 millimeters. So really period correct proportions. The weight is at just over 52 grams. The lugs curve down very slightly. It's not the most 
curvaceous of lugs, but it does hug the wrist. Now you can see on my six and a quarter inch wrist, it wears masterfully well. Now it does come on a choice of straps. I have to say, I've really loved this particular strap. Uh, it's a kind of grainy finish, uh, semi-gloss. They taper down from 20 to about, uh, what was it? It does say on the back. Yeah, to a 16, you have a, a signed buckle, of course. Now there's a wide variety of colors and they are all equipped with the, um, what I like to call the, uh, the bolt action quick release little system there. Now the watch is entirely stainless steel. We have a mostly brushed case, then a high polished bezel, uh, drilled lug holes there, a, a wonderful, really exaggerated K1 crystal that is actually harder than the Seiko Hardlex. It's sapphire coated, double domed uh, mineral with anti-reflective treatment and it just has these wonderfully uh, bewitching distortions as you can see there of that richly uh, detailed dial. Now there are two main configurations, well there's, there's several colors available of dial but essentially there's two different versions so this gives you two different VK uh, family of Seiko uh, Mecha Quartz movements but if you have the complications there vertically it's the VK61A and then horizontally it's the VK64A. On the horizontal layout you have the 24 hours uh, at the three o'clock and then the minutes or 60 minute counter for the main chronograph the same function for the pushers these flat uh, stop start and then reset there and then on the uh, vertical we have 60 minute counter at the 12 and then at the uh, six we have a sub seconds but aside from the different variation in complications the chronographs function the same and you've got corresponding applied numerals in the uh, adjacent position. So for example, here we have three and nine with the vertical and then the horizontal we have 12 and six. Now all these watches are 30 meters water resistant. The gilt dial, which is absolutely stunning, very rich kind of almost brown sun soaked uh, gilt there. And of course matching gilt hands. Whereas this is, I would say actually it's almost like a slate gray on, on the darker dial has corresponding uh, silver hands. Now, m the one I really like is the silver dial with the, the gold hands, just gives it a little pop of color. And then we have faux painted blue hands, one for the uh, main seconds of the chronograph and the uh, 60 minute register there. Both these movements, with the exception of the differing complications, uh, have the same specs, essentially. Um, accuracy of the movement is plus or minus 20 seconds per month at a normal temperature. They're very reliable, affordable to replace, maintain, powered by a single uh, 394 battery and has the life of approximately uh, three years. But obviously that can be subject to how much you use the uh, chronograph. What I don't mention often is about these particular movements is that they have quite a, a good resistance to magnetism as well. And they are of course Seiko made. On the crocodile strap, uh, the same thickness, and I have to say it's very nicely supple uh, feeling leather. I really like this one. I don't know why I've just absolutely taken to it, but don't get me wrong. I think this is very snazzy and smart indeed. Now, there's no bracelet or anything like that. All the watches come in a choice of either uh, with these dials, uh, with or without date. But in my opinion, I do prefer the no date. I think it has more symmetry, but we'll get onto that in just a moment. Like Dan Henry's, uh, the first Dan Henry I experienced, we return to the 1930s. Uh, the 1939 chronograph had the telemeter scale um, to calculate distance via time and obviously was military inspired um, from that interwar period. The 1937 is a bit more of a civilian dressy affair uh, compared to the, um, the other 1930s predecessor. The square pushes, the leaf hands, the sector dial is very reminiscent, especially on this particular one of the uh, Patek reference 530. So basically a sector dial, if you look at the hands, uh, they point towards each section. So the wearer of the watch can focus on what was important to them. For example, seconds for a doctor measuring a pulse or the uh, using the tachometer there uh, to, to judge speed, or measure speed rather. Uh, and then you got the hour hand with the hours there. It's just a very e efficient way of doing it. And this was 
typical in the Art Deco um, period. My fave has to be the silver dial uh, variants here. Um, I just love the, the contrasting finishes. Um, I don't think you get it on the others. Well, no, you don't, uh, but you, you see directional brushing and then contrasted by concentric brushing. It just adds a little bit more depth and works wonderfully with the curvature of the domed crystal. Uh, you get kind of distortions on the numerals, uh, sorry, the, the printing there. It's, it's very, very bewitching indeed. And really does remind me of the JLC Master Chronograph, the reference uh, 1538530. 530. So it's a kind of amalgamation of JLC, uh, a ton of chronographs of the 1930s, but mostly I would say Patek as well. Now we do get a signed engraved crown rather understated and it's a flat crown too which i think is, is perfectly suited to the proportions um and but on on the back we have another uh let me just turn it around there another one of dan's splendid case backs he's kind of made a name for himself with these amazing uh, reliefs that pay homage to the era that uh, each watch is inspired by so here dan has chosen the central hudson locomotive very much is the ultimate art deco kind of symbol of engineering and a very classy mode of travel uh, on the east coast and was trend setting for for decades and i love how um the sandblasted finish of the, of the case back uh, accentuates the three-dimensional quality of, and the charm of this locomotive dan actually stated to me he said that the 1937 is a tribute to the cosmopolitan Art Deco style when watches such as these were worn by stylish New Yorkers from Rockefeller Center to Wall Street. He said it was an era that combined sophisticated elegance with a modern age cutting edge technology. Now on the gilt black dial version, um, you'll see gold hands and I think it does work extremely well. There's an amazing sense of balance. Of course, there's two lines of symmetry, both vertically and horizontally, whichever way you go. And I love the little applied if we can go close up there the little applied numerals it just finishes it off just love that little pop of yellow gold the layout is crucial here um, because it very much embodies one of the key defining features of art deco or the art deco aesthetic and that is um, there's always mathematical symmetry in the mirroring of bold geometric shapes and you'll see it in absolutely everything um, built and designed or well, mostly everything in during that period it just lends itself to being very timelessly classic and always exceedingly good taste you cannot deny well the 1930s uh, was, saw the peak of this international style of design uh, before it ended uh, with the outbreak of world war ii of course before those dark clouds um, enveloped to the world new york in particular that dan draws inspiration from was uh, at its greatest uh, peak, you could say, in terms of architecture, art and culture. One only has to look at the Chrysler building as a prime example and uh, the many other um, iconic skyscrapers of New York built between the 1920s into the 30s as monuments to the Art Deco style. It permeated into everything. It influenced the design of not just buildings, but furniture, jewelry, cars, fashion, movie theaters, trains, ocean liners, even everyday objects such as radios and vacuum cleaners, and of course, watches too. With all Dan's watches, it offers unbeatable value. I believe the price is around 250. Um, don't quote me on that, might be a little bit more. It's a very fun and accessible way that mere mortals like me and you can enjoy watches that um, can often be either too rare, too expensive, or just, you know, not, not really a viable choice for us to spend money on right now. Um, just to give you an example, the Patek 530 from the late 1930s can reach many hundreds of thousands uh, of dollars at auction. And that's not even to mention the, the upkeep costs, the servicing costs, all the rest of it. And then, to be honest, I, I, it would be so expensive, I'd be petrified to wear it. The quality is, as always, very solid and uh, extremely well uh, executed. There was only a, a slight QC issue with the black dial with a little speck of dust under the, um, the crystal there. But aside from that, it, I, I mean, it's flawless um, execution and, and uh, finishing, absolutely. Everything was crisp and, and precise and lines up and functions 
uh, perfectly well. So I can totally recommend it. Uh, it is a perfect size, uh, any larger, and I think it would betray its old world feeling and uh, sense of authenticity it does evoke. Um, it's a very elegant, extremely classic and classy. I mean, Dan wanted to make essentially uh, a gentleman's chronograph. Uh, and I think he undoubtedly triumphed here. By choosing the Art Deco age, its style will also last forever. I mean, it, it, you cannot argue with Art Deco being anything other than good taste. Um, also, I have to say, as I engage the chronograph there, um, the Mecca one-fifth of a second uh, sweep does give it a little bit of soul. Um, it's not just a, another quartz watch. Uh, that's what I do like about Mecca quartz movement and i have to confess i like the horizontally lined ones a little bit more because you don't get the ticking seconds so you kind of forget that it is a quartz now also we must note that as you can see on the back let me just show you there they are individually numbered uh, so this is number 99 oh that's pretty cool out of uh, 1937 uh, dan always does that and i think that will help protect its value um, definitely enhances its collectability. And um, for the wearer, kind of makes it a little, feel a little bit more special. So what about the negatives? Well, um, I've got to say, uh, it's not a casual watch. It's only really intended for kind of smarter, um, more formal wear. I mean, you could dress kind of smart casual. I wouldn't be able to wear this with a tracksuit or casually so I almost feel like it makes me kind of want to dress up a little bit more as a dress watch absolutely perfectly I mean uh, it wears kind of like a dress watch probably its main downfall will be its size there's always going to be people that are going to deem this just simply far too small even though during the 1930s this would have been considered absolutely jumbo sized or oversized I'd love to see a manual wind version um, I know that's going to push up the price dramatically. Uh, the problem is this kind of price range, around 500, under 1,000 seagull movements are probably your best bet and they have uh, quite notoriously bad re reliability problems. Um, I'd personally be willing to pay, you know, four times, five times the price of this to get something that is mechanical, maybe a basic Valjou or something like that. Uh, at the end of the day, by not being mechanical, it is more accessible uh, to more people. So in conclusion, well, I have to say, uh, undoubtedly another Capo Lavoro from Dan. I think it really captures and encapsulates the, the age and its complications echo the the essence, uh, the romance of this uh, time period perfectly. Um, Art Deco at the end of the day was all about combining function and style. Uh, during its heyday, uh, Art Deco represented luxury, glamour, exuberance, uh, technological uh, progress. I mean, the watch uh, embodies all of these uh, feelings perfectly. Dan Henry very much is uh, a brand by a watch enthusiast for watch enthusiasts and um, offers real class uh, for the price of a typical fashion watch. I mean, let's be honest here. So yeah, hats off to Dan. Um, un abbraccio forte, amico mio. Absolutely knocked it out of the park once again. Yeah, um, what more can I say? Anyway, guys, I'm going to leave it there. Let me know which is your favorite. What do you feel about it? Um, your comments all the rest of it down below. Thank you so much for watching. A massive shout out to Dan for making this review possible. Um, yeah, am I going to sell my 1962? Well, actually, I might keep this. I am contemplating this one, I have to say. Um, and that's the, the, that's the thing with these watches. They're so accessible. It's difficult to say no to, you know. Please don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it and found it useful. And as always, I will catch you in the next one. Thank you for watching. Ciao.